I got a great introduction, but I like to show people that I've actually worked at a couple of places and, and gone to school. This has always been my attempt to be taken seriously, and what really happens is people say, so you haven't really figured out what you want to do when you grow up, and it's like, okay, that's true. Um, but I do spend a lot of time working at Singularity University, and we think a lot about what it means to apply these technologies in the future, and this has been sort of a preoccupation of mine for the last couple of decades. What does it mean as we enter this decade, uh, this century that is more and more predominantly biotechnological? It has so many promises and perils. And what does it mean to grow up in a century like this? And sort of my personal journey, one of the things that happened to me along the, these lines is I had this, this moment of Satori or Really, I like to think of it about being kicked in the head. I think all really profound educational experiences are that sort of transformative thing that's also a little painful as your preconceptions switch. Um, the first thing that happened to me has probably happened to a lot of you guys, and this, I've had three different times that I've been kicked in the head because uh, my skull's pretty thick, and so it took a while to sort of get through to me. But um, was becoming a father. That was my first thing. You know, this is very mundane, but very transformative, but also very different in the biotech century. So, so here are my baby pictures. A, a dad always likes to show his baby pictures. These are my twin boys three days after they were conceived. Each one of them has about eight cells. There's the quiet one right there. There's the one who talks a lot. This is really weird that we now have this capability to not just reproduce this way, but to see what this is like. And it's becoming more and more common. And in some ways, this is sort of the gateway drug to the genetic engineering of human beings. And it's also becoming sort of the family portrait of the 21st century. So again, this juxtaposition of very weird and very homey and commonplace. The other kick in the head, the next one that happened to me was when I was working at a company, uh, doing really good work. I, I'm, I'm very proud and pleased that I got to work for these guys. But we had this, this campaign where we would talk about this work. We had invented next generation sequencing, a, a kind of DNA sequencing that was exponential. Okay, so instead of things getting cheaper at 2x a year, they started getting cheaper at 5x a year, and nobody believed it, and it was amazing, and everybody made lots of money, and I became a Silicon Valley thousandaire, which is not as good as being a millionaire, but it's okay. Um, but they had this campaign where we would talk about DNA sequencing for the masses. Everybody can do this now. And really, that was a lie, or at least it was true only in the sense if you had a million dollars... US to buy one of these machines. You had a fully equipped lab to use it in, and you were starting out with about a PhD level of understanding. So this bothered me because I saw how powerful this technology was, but how hard it was to access at different strata in society, you know, in low versus high income nations, or for just people who wanted to understand what was going on with it. And then I saw something, this third kick in the head that sort of turned me around. This device, so this is a machine called an open PCR machine, and it's kind of funny for a biotech machine. It's not what you would be used to, but it's made out of plywood for one thing. It was invented by two guys who were reformed software engineers. They were getting out of the software engineering business. One of them had worked for eBay. They said, I, we want to work on something that means something. We want to work on biotechnology. Let's figure out how to reinvent one of these really expensive devices. And they came up with this. It's a PCR machine. It is the polymerase chain reaction. And the thing to know about that is it's a copy machine for DNA. It lets you go ahead and start with just a few DNA molecules and make enough to examine and, 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 and manipulate. And, and it's the starting place for anything you do in biotech. They made this about 100 times cheaper than what you could buy it from, from a research company. 
It was an open hardware initiative, meaning that they actually published all their plans. This is how they sourced it. These are the things they did. They even gave you the computer files where if you wanted to go ahead and, and cut the little plywood and make the little aluminum blocks yourself, you could do this. Uh, crowdfunded it through Kickstarter and encouraged people to use this for citizen science. Is this something that everybody could use? And to me, this was a really amazing thing. They had taken this fairly hard to get expensive piece of lab equipment and made it accessible. So that was my kick in the head and that really made me think a lot about the fact that as we come of age in the biotech century, it's going to be all about the access to the tools. And I mean that beyond just being a technocrat, a Silicon Valley guy, reform technocrat, being somebody who loves gadgets, what I mean is we're all citizens of the future where a lot of that is going to be about big, complex systems that we have to decide whether to ban or allow or fund and which one goes over the other one. And we can either accept other people's ideas for that or know something about it ourselves. We're either going to be used by these systems or use them. And this is a chance for us to do something better. And so this became sort of a theme for me. There were about five other people who really believed in this. We liked the idea of all of these tools not being just stuck away in academic and corporate ivory towers, but for more people to be able to get access to them. And so we came up with this, BioCurious. BioCurious, this was the very first hackerspace for biotech. And the idea, it's a, a biohacker lab. Uh, our mission statement is that we're committed to making biotech affordable, accessible, and open to everyone. It opened up the permanent space in Sunnyvale, California, right in the geographical center of Silicon Valley. It's a not-for-profit, and it's supported by memberships. It's basically a gym membership for science. So people can come in and pay 100 bucks a month and in just a little dingy office park, it's not some big fancy Facebook headquarters, you get access to about $3 million worth of biotech equipment. And more than the equipment, more than the gadgets, you get access to a community of people who can show you how to use it and what works and what doesn't. And they're like, what do you want to do today? And we have artists and scientists, professional and amateur scientists, we have activists, we have people coming in, school kids, inventors, and it's been a really amazing experience. Let me show you a picture. This is the day that we actually opened the space. I want you to look and notice two things, or I want to tell you two stories about it. <clears throat> One is we're very cheap. Everything in there we got, <coughs> excuse me, used or off of the internet. We didn't pay for anything that we didn't have to. People donated things to us. We didn't even buy furniture. The lab benches are made out of uh, steel poles that you would use for fencing and plywood, which is why they're kind of bowed. But this is one of our themes. It's like, can you do it and be good enough instead of some fancy best 100 times as expensive? The other thing is one of the co-founders, there were six people who co-founded this. Only two of us are even marginally scientists. There were two economists a philosopher and an HR specialist. Uh, she's back there. She had worked on this for two years before we opened the space and she came up to me the day we'd opened. She says, this may actually work. So that was kind of a nice little bit there. Uh, to give you an idea of what we do, we, we teach a lot of classes. Here's a typical class where the students go and the first day they build their own PCR machine. And I mean, they solder it and put it together and they make their own DNA copying machine. The second day, they extract their own DNA, they purify it, use the PCR machine to amplify a particular gene. And one of these young women wanted to look at her BRCA1 gene. This is the gene you may have heard of Angelina Jolie had had this medically diagnosed. It uh, determines somewhat your, your predisposition for ovarian or breast cancer. And so we sequence that, get it back, and then we bioinformatically 
analyze the data. Here's a computer readout of a portion of her sequence for that gene. This is the good version. We had good news for her. But this was considered fairly radical at the time. This was something where you know, people couldn't access these tools or self-diagnose or do anything like this. And we showed, no, from beginning to end in three days, you can build the tools and do it yourself. I'll give you another bit that we do. We do a lot for inventors and entrepreneurs. And this was one of my main things. You know, in, in, if, if this would, had been LA, everybody's got uh, a, a, a script, right? Everybody's a screenwriter. But this is Silicon Valley. Everybody has a business plan. So we had a lot of inventors. And that's the, the thing whenever you're in Silicon Valley, that myth made real is of the company where you have a couple of guys in a garage with laptops and sawhorses for desks, and then they create Facebook. When you try to do that with biotech, it's hard because you've got to have a couple of guys in a garage with a million dollars to buy all the equipment. But we wanted to do that for biotech by accumulating all this equipment in one place and saying, $100, you can come and access it for a month. And this worked out not just pretty well, but just unbelievably well. We've had, in the past five years, we've had over 50 companies start and then graduate from BioCurious. They've raised over $129 million in follow-on funding. Some of them have actually donated some of their equity in the companies back to BioCurious. We don't ask people to do that. We don't take intellectual property, but they've been kind enough because they appreciated the start they've got. In 20 years, BioCurious will have one of those big fancy buildings and will be a big foundation because of things like that. Um, we've seen now uh, startups and schools and uh, large corporations copying this model to go ahead and do their own accelerators and startups. And what has just stunned me is there are now dozens, maybe now a hundred different biohacker spaces all around the world. I got to visit in about the last year and a half all of these spaces up and down the West Coast on all but about two continents. I've gotten to see different biohacker spaces. Each one has different kinds of users. Each one has its own character, things that they care about. Some people are very much into the art. Some people are very much into the politics of it, the, the economics and the haves and haves nots. Uh, it's been just amazing if you get a chance. And if you live in any urban center, you are close to a biohacker space. I will almost guarantee it not excluding Berlin. So I haven't gotten to visit with the guys at Biotinkering Berlin, but I suspect, this is that kind of crowd, I suspect some of them are here. Is anybody here from Biotinkering Berlin? Will you raise your hands or stand up if you're here? Make a little noise. I'm gonna track them down, but if you get a chance, look at the meetup group, and I believe they meet twice a month, and they've got some sort of a permanent space. So. The thing that I wanted to just so finish up telling you guys is it was really funny as we're trying to open the space and do all these things, you know, my, my very first concern was how can we do this and not violate a bunch of international laws about doing weird things with biotech and then how do we keep the doors open and then supporting some of these companies coming in. But we had a tremendous amount of children in the classes, people under 18. We actually had to fight to make sure that people under 18 were allowed in the space. There had been a lot of concerns about, oh, if they have access to these kind of expensive tools or these kind of dangerous tools, what does that mean? And so we, we made sure that that was happening. But several interesting things were happening there. One, I'll just point out, was kids took to this technology just unbelievably well, better than I've seen kids take to computers. Here is a class that we teach. It's sort of our genetic engineering 101 class. You take a bacteria, you take a gene from jellyfish, you splice it in, you make it glow. And it's very fun, very interesting. What you might not realize though, the two teachers in the class are the tall gentleman in back, who's from a, a sequencing company there in Silicon Valley, and the short young scientist in the front who's in second grade, who's eight years old, very self-possessed young woman. She walked in and she said, okay, you guys are doing this wrong and this is how you use the pipetter. You've gotta go ahead and start doing this. I've done this before, let me show you. And she's come back and taught classes for us now. We've actually had genetic engineers now who graduated from this class at five years old. 
which is amazing to do, and I have stories about that. We've had people as young as two come in and do different classes about biology, and you know, some of them we let play with the really scary equipment and some of them not. <laughs> but one of the things that we noticed that started happening was um, we opened up a class called Saturday Morning Science, and after just a couple of months, it was almost exclusively male. There were a bunch of, of young boys in it. And we looked at it and talked to people, and one of the things that was happening is we just had a few pieces of equipment, and everybody had to kind of line up or compete for it. How many people have been in a computer class, and there were 20 people in the class and one computer or something? And this is like my experience in the 80s, right? And so what happens to the people with the sharp elbows, the people who compete for the resources, get access to that. And so that had been a problem, scarcity matters. We stopped trying to have some of the best equipment and have one or two pieces. We started trying to have some kind of piece of equipment for everybody or have people work in teams of two and assign it together where they would work. And fairly quickly, we turned this gender gap problem around. Now in Saturday Morning Science, last time we did our statistics, 70% of the students are women or young women, girls. So that was nice. Another bit was trust matters. We've got this crazy expensive piece of equipment. Are you gonna turn a 12 year old loose on it? Or you have something where somebody could put out an eye, right? Are we really gonna let people do that? Well, we do. And people continuously are amazed by the children who are in the lab autonomously using some of these pieces of equipment. Once they're trained, once they're told, we are showing you what to do, you're responsible for it, here's some supervision, here's somebody who can help you, but it's up to you to do it and do it right. And so do we really let kids go hands-on with blow torches? Why, yes, yes we do. And good outcomes so far. So what we're striving for is this democratization of biotechnology. We're trying to find more ways to get pieces of real equipment so people can do real research into the hands of some of these young scientists. And I think that this is particularly important. Um, we, we got a nice honor this last year, BioCurious, which I don't really consider really a company or somebody who's all about education, got named number four on the Fast Company list, so that was unexpected but appreciated. But what we're really now trying to do is find people, designers, artists, writers, educators, and yeah, you know, one or two engineers and scientists who can help and go ahead and create new research tools, crash the price of these things so that you can put them in a lab in every city in the world, and then in every school in the world, and then in every kitchen in the world, because I firmly believe we need to go ahead and do really a revolution, right? What we want to have happen is the people who are going to make the technologies that will cure all of the diseases that all of us are gonna die from otherwise have a couple of choices. They can go and they can be writing apps or they can go and be working on the hard parts of biology. And I don't want 50 years from now to have an iPad 12 with Angry Birds, you know, whatever, and I can't see it because I'm drooling because I've got Alzheimer's. I want one of those kids in my lab to go on and cure that. So this is what we're working on. If you're interested in it and you want to point your kids at biohacking resources, please take a look at that URL or come and help out. Thank you guys so much. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>